In this lesson, we're going to begin our discussion of subject matter jurisdiction. Specifically, we're going to focus on state subject matter jurisdiction versus federal subject matter jurisdiction. And we're just going to go over some key concepts, things like exclusive jurisdiction versus concurrent jurisdiction and limited jurisdiction versus general jurisdiction at both the state and federal levels. Once we have all of this down, we're going to have the foundation laid for subject matter jurisdiction. And then we can really get into some of the core concepts in future lessons, which is all going to fall under federal subject matter jurisdiction when we get into things like federal question jurisdiction and diversity jurisdiction, supplemental jurisdiction, the real heart of our subject matter jurisdiction. But again, here, we just want to lay the foundation, go over some of the big picture stuff. So if we think back to our last lesson, remember our three basic requirements to hear and decide a case before it, a court generally must have subject matter jurisdiction over the particular type of case before it, personal jurisdiction over the defendant, and proper venue based on locality. Of course, in this lesson, we're going to focus on subject matter jurisdiction. If you remember from our last lesson, just to quickly overview subject matter jurisdiction, remember we said that subject matter jurisdiction is all about whether the court can hear the particular type of case before it. So, and usually we're thinking about like federal courts, right? If a $50 breach of contract action comes in between two citizens of the same state into federal court, we know typically that's not the type of case a federal court is going to have subject matter jurisdiction over. This is just not the subject matter a federal court can adjudicate, okay? That's the big picture idea. It's all about whether this case that has come in through the doors is the type of case that this court can hear and decide. That's what subject matter jurisdiction is all about. So here we say a court must have subject matter jurisdiction to enter an enforceable judgment on a claim. So what happens if a plaintiff comes to say federal court, they file an action in federal court, and the entire case is decided, right? The litigation process goes all the way through. We have all the pretrial stuff, the trial happens, an outcome is determined. But later on, it's determined that the federal court did not have valid subject matter jurisdiction over the case. What happens? Well, in that situation, all of those decisions, all of the rulings that that federal court made along the way, all of the rulings and all of the motions, all of the evidentiary objections, all those decisions that the court made from day one until the outcome of the lawsuit was determined, all of it can be invalidated potentially if it turns out that that court never had valid subject matter jurisdiction over the case. So this is something we want to be very cognizant of. We want to get this right. We want to make sure that the court has valid subject matter jurisdiction to hear and decide the case before it. Otherwise, everything it decides can potentially be thrown out, invalidated. And this is actually a very unique feature of subject matter jurisdiction. While parties may waive personal jurisdiction, they cannot waive subject matter jurisdiction. So with personal jurisdiction, if a defendant basically makes an appearance in court, shows up and starts participating on the merits of the case, at that point, at some point at least, during that litigation process, the court is going to say, okay, because the defendant has shown up and he's participating, he obviously doesn't have a problem with the forum state where this action is located. So we're just going to say he's either consenting to personal jurisdiction in this form, or he's waiving his motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction because this defendant has shown up and he's participating. Remember, personal jurisdiction is all about protecting the due process rights of the defendant. So if a defendant shows up and starts participating, well, obviously he doesn't care that much, right, about it. At least that's what the court is going to assume. And for that reason, basically he waives his objection, his motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction. And you can't really get that back. Once it's waived, it's gone. So if he ends up losing the lawsuit, he can't challenge, oh, well, the court never had personal jurisdiction over me in the first place. Doesn't work. That challenge has essentially been waived. That's personal jurisdiction. Subject matter jurisdiction is the complete opposite. 
Okay, subject matter jurisdiction, a challenge for subject matter jurisdiction can be brought at any point in the litigation process. It can be brought before trial, during trial, after the lawsuit, after trial, any part of the litigation process, subject matter jurisdiction can be challenged. Even if a party once argued, hey, subject matter jurisdiction exists in this case, they can change their mind. If they lose the lawsuit, they can go back and say, actually, it didn't exist. This should be thrown out. Okay, so at any point, subject matter jurisdiction is not waived. This is the opposite of personal jurisdiction. Also important to note here, a court can actually dismiss a case sua sponte for lack of subject matter jurisdiction, which just means on its own. A court can dismiss a case on its own, even if neither party actually challenges subject matter jurisdiction. The court can basically just look at it and say, hey, we don't have the power to decide this case. You need to file this somewhere else. Sua sponte on its own, even if neither party files a motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter jurisdiction. This is a really important kind of timing feature we want to keep in mind. This is something that gets tested all the time in law school on the bar exam. Personal jurisdiction can be waived. Subject matter jurisdiction cannot be waived. We want to always keep that in mind as we work through these analyses. Okay, and then Kind of our last big picture point to make when we're thinking about subject matter jurisdiction generally is federal courts versus state courts. Remember, we talked about this a lot in our last lesson. Federal courts are courts of limited jurisdiction, right? We know federal courts can only hear particular types of cases. They can't just hear anything that comes in through their doors, right? And remember, we said really the main two types of cases federal courts can hear are diversity cases and federal question cases. We'll see there's some other things that they can hear, but those are the big two, federal question cases and diversity cases. Those are the types of cases a federal court can hear. And for this reason, we say federal courts have limited jurisdiction. They're limited in the types of things that they can hear, where state courts are have more unlimited jurisdiction. We call state courts courts of general jurisdiction. They can hear more stuff. Okay, they're more unlimited in the subject matters they can take on, the cases they can hear and decide. Okay, and we talked a lot about that in our last lesson, so I don't want to rehash all of it here. But when we're thinking about state subject matter jurisdiction, we say while state courts are typically considered to have general jurisdiction, which we know is a more unlimited form of subject matter jurisdiction, all states do have some courts of limited jurisdiction. These courts have the authority only to hear particular types of cases. The classic example would be a small claims court. So important to recognize here, while on, if we're looking at a law school or bar exam fact pattern and we see reference to a state court, we assume, unless we are told otherwise, that it's a court of general jurisdiction. It can hear almost any type of case. We'll see, basically, as long as federal law or some other law has not prohibited the state court from hearing the case, it's going to, under its general jurisdiction kind of authority, be able to hear that case. It's a very broad authority. You know, we'll see there are some types of cases that are exclusively federal and state courts can't hear and decide those cases because federal law prohibits it. But for the most part, if we see a state court on a law school or bar exam fact pattern, we assume it has general authority. It can hear almost any type of case. Again, unless it's a case that has been like exclusively prohibited by federal law. OK, now there are some and it's important to recognize state courts of limited jurisdiction, and this would be like a small claims court. OK, so a small claims court is limited in the subject matter. It can hear basically to a certain dollar amount. Small claims courts, it's going to be different across different jurisdictions, but say it's like five thousand dollars. Right. There's a cap on the subject matter it can hear. And that cap is the amount in controversy. Anything over, say, five thousand dollars, that small claims court is not going to have the jurisdiction to hear. It's limited. OK, based on the amount in controversy. So there are some state courts like a small claims court that are not general jurisdiction courts. It's limited. It can only hear cases that 
are going to meet that criteria. And for a small claims court, it would be the amount in controversy requirement. You could also have something like a state probate court. Obviously, a state probate court is going to be limited to subject matters involving the administration of estates. You can't file a tort negligence claim in a state probate court. It doesn't have the jurisdiction to hear that. It's limited in its jurisdiction to probate matters, administration of estates. Okay, so there are some state courts that have limited jurisdiction but unless we're told otherwise, we basically assume state courts have general jurisdiction, can hear almost any type of case. Okay, so however, we say here, every state has at least one court of general jurisdiction, remember, can hear almost any type of case, which has a comprehensive residual subject matter jurisdiction to hear and decide all cases not exclusively allocated to state or federal courts of limited jurisdiction. And we just touched on this. Federal courts have been granted exclusive jurisdiction over certain subject matters pursuant to federal law. This would be like patent law, copyright law, admiralty and maritime law, bankruptcy cases. There are basically some areas of federal law where Congress or the U.S. Constitution has said this is specifically only for federal courts. State courts cannot adjudicate in these subject matters. OK, it's exclusively for federal courts. This would be things like copyright cases, patent cases. These cases cannot be filed in state courts because basically federal law prohibits it. OK, this is exclusive jurisdiction. And keep in mind, you know, bear with me for one second. We're going to at the end of this lesson, we're going to have a visual Venn diagram that like shows how all of this works. So you'll see it at the end. If it's kind of confusing right now, we'll see kind of how it all fits together at the end. OK, one other concept before we get to our diagram, when we're thinking about state subject matter jurisdiction. It's important to recognize that there is concurrent versus exclusive subject matter jurisdiction. So we just talked about what exclusive subject matter jurisdiction is. This is like copyright cases where Congress or federal law has basically said, hey, state courts are not allowed to adjudicate these subject matters. They're exclusively for federal courts. So concurrent jurisdiction is the opposite, right? Concurrent jurisdiction exists when multiple types of courts can hear cases on the same subject matter, while exclusive jurisdiction exists when only one type of court has the authority to hear cases on a particular subject matter. So what does this all look like? Let's just get to our chart because this is going to be like the best way to visualize this. So if we're looking at this Venn diagram right here, let's just work left to right. Obviously on the left side, big picture, we have like federal courts. On the right side, we have state courts. Let's work left to right jurisdiction of federal courts to jurisdiction of state courts and kind of what's in between with concurrent jurisdiction. Okay, so if we start on the left side of this Venn diagram with exclusive jurisdiction of federal courts, this is what we just talked about. Okay, sometimes federal law says these subject matters, okay, it could be admiralty law, maritime, bankruptcy, copyright, patent cases. These are some you know, main examples. This is not an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the big ones. Admiralty, maritime, bankruptcy, copyright, patent cases, all of these subject matters. Basically, federal law has said these are reserved for federal courts. State courts cannot adjudicate on these subject matters. So we say these are matters, subject matters, that are the exclusive jurisdiction of federal courts because federal law prohibits state courts from adjudicating on these matters. Simple enough. That's the far left of our Venn diagram. As we work towards the middle, okay, we get concurrent jurisdiction. This just means both federal courts and state courts can adjudicate these subject matters. The big two we're going to have in the middle of concurrent jurisdiction are diversity jurisdiction and federal question jurisdiction. So if we have a subject matter that has not been expressly allocated to be like exclusively federal, like admiralty, maritime, bankruptcy, copyright, patent cases, okay? But it does satisfy diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction, which remember we talked about in our last lesson. Diversity jurisdiction would just mean the lawsuit involves parties who are diverse from different states and the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000 
Federal question jurisdiction would just mean the lawsuit arises under federal law. Remember, we have that ingredient of federal law in the claim. Okay, so if either of these are satisfied, and again, it has not, the subject matter involved has not been expressly kind of allocated to federal courts as exclusive jurisdiction, like admiralty, maritime, bankruptcy, copyright, patent cases. Okay, then either state courts or federal courts can hear the case under concurrent jurisdiction. In other words, the plaintiff gets to decide where he wants to file it. He can file it in state court or federal court. If diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction is satisfied, both state courts and federal courts are going to have concurrent jurisdiction over the case. Again, so long as federal law doesn't prohibit the state court from hearing that subject matter. OK, that's concurrent jurisdiction. Big picture concept to recognize here is for the most part, generally speaking, if federal question jurisdiction or diversity jurisdiction is satisfied, plaintiff gets to choose. He can file it in state court or federal court. Both have the authority to hear and decide those cases. Moving on to the right side of the Venn diagram, we kind of get to the jurisdiction of state courts and we see there's limited jurisdiction state courts and general jurisdiction state courts. As we're on the right side of this Venn diagram, we're assuming that diversity jurisdiction and federal question jurisdiction are not satisfied. If diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction is satisfied, then remember, federal courts can also hear the claim. That would be concurrent jurisdiction. So as we get to the right side, we're assuming neither federal question or diversity jurisdiction is satisfied, which would typically mean we have a state law claim where the parties are not diverse or the amount in controversy is less than $75,000. These claims are kind of where we get to the right side, because in those cases, diversity jurisdiction is not satisfied. Federal question jurisdiction is not satisfied, and it doesn't fall under one of these exclusive jurisdiction of the federal court subject matters because it's a state law claim. Claim. Okay. So on the right side, we have limited jurisdiction state courts and general jurisdiction state courts. Remember, we talked about limited jurisdiction state courts. These are like small claims courts, state probate courts. Okay. They're courts that say we're only going to hear these particular types of cases. Small claims courts would be we're only going to hear types of cases that are $5,000 or less. Everything else outside of our authority. State probate courts are saying, hey, look, we're only going to hear and decide matters that deal with the administrations of estates, probate matters, everything else outside of our limited jurisdiction. They're state courts, but they're limited in the types of things that they can hear. OK, which leaves us with everything else. Finally, we get to the bottom right of the Venn diagram, our residual subject matter jurisdiction. This is the general jurisdiction state courts. And basically, they can hear everything else that we haven't talked about. It's not something that has been allocated exclusively to federal courts. It's not a concurrent jurisdiction, neither diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction are satisfied. And it's not a limited jurisdiction state court issue, something like a small claims court, a state probate court, everything else then. Like the catch all would be that bottom right court quadrant, which would be general jurisdiction state courts. They have that residual subject matter jurisdiction. So this would be like a state law claim that does not satisfy diversity or federal question jurisdiction. So this would be like your garden variety $50,000 breach of contract claim or your garden variety $50,000 tort negligence claim. OK, obviously, those are not exclusively federal things. They're not like admiralty, maritime, bankruptcy, copyright, patent cases. There's no federal law that says state courts cannot adjudicate contract cases or tort cases. So, OK, it's on the far left. We know diversity jurisdiction and federal question are not satisfied. There's state law claims, so federal question is not satisfied. The amount in controversy is less than 75,000, so diversity is not satisfied. OK, it's not a limited jurisdiction state court because it's not small claims. Small claims would be like $5,000 or less. It's not a state 
probate court or some other type of limited jurisdiction state court. You know, it doesn't deal with the administration of estates. It's like a breach of contract or tort claims. So all of those, which is like the vast majority of like state law claims and litigation are going to fall in these general jurisdiction state courts under this residual subject matter jurisdiction authority. Okay, if you understand this Venn diagram, that's the main concept to take away from this lesson. We just want to know the difference between exclusive jurisdiction and concurrent jurisdiction, kind of the difference between limited jurisdiction and general jurisdiction at the state level. But of course, we know the real heart of our analysis is federal subject matter jurisdiction, which we're going to get into in our next lesson. Remember, in law school and on the bar exam, Typically, subject matter jurisdiction is really at only an issue when we're dealing with federal courts, because federal courts are more limited in the types of cases they can hear. State courts, remember, there's going to be in every state at least one court of general jurisdiction. So there's not much of an analysis there because like, it's just the catch-all. It's going to get everything else. Usually what we're dealing with law school and bar exam is whether this federal court has the authority to hear this type of case. And usually we're not going to be dealing with things that are exclusively federal, like copyright and patent cases. It's going to be things that fall in the middle of that Venn diagram on the concurrent jurisdiction spectrum, federal question jurisdiction and diversity jurisdiction. This is where we're really going to get into the heart of the issues we see classically tested in law school and on the bar exam. And we'll get into that starting with our next lesson. We're going to get into to federal subject matter jurisdiction, where I believe we're starting with federal question jurisdiction. But until then, guys, I wish you all the absolute best and I'll see you at our next lesson.